grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to We Are One United Methodist Church, a church that loves the Lord and display it by loving on His people. We pray that the seeds that are sown on today will bring forth a harvest 30, 60, even 100 times for the song. Welcome to We Are One United Right where you are, you ought to rejoice, stand and be glad. Go ahead and stand on your feet this morning. Right where you are, start giving God glory for the fact that you are alive and well this morning. And if you are my will, let's give the glory for the fact that you are alive and that He's able to do all things, including make you well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last week, Pastor talked to us about the truth being of Philippians 4 and 13. And one of the points that he took is that we can, it's because God can. Hallelujah. You told us that when Jesus took the tree in the word can and carried it to Calvary, he created a cross. And he only left us with C-A-N. He left us with pain. And because he did that, we can do all this through his glory, through his power. And I'm glad this morning that I serve a God that can. That I serve a God that can. If you serve a God that can this morning, go ahead and start clapping your hands. In your comments this morning, go ahead and start saying, God, you can. God, you can. But guess what? There's one more thing. God can do all things. But there's one thing that he cannot do. There's one thing that he cannot do, and I'm glad about it. And that's death, and that is that he cannot fail. If you're glad that God cannot fail this morning, you write in the comments this morning and say, God, is glad you can't fail. God, you care about the battle. You never lost the battle, and I know you never will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship this morning. Is that all right? Can we worship God this morning? Hallelujah.
acceptable in thy sight. For God, you are a rock, our strength, and our redemption. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I want to thank you once again for joining us this morning. We know that you could have been tuning into any other virtual service. But you decided to join us, and for that, we are truly grateful. Our sermon topic this morning is breaking point. You know, for years, I was by vocation. I was a traveling salesman and a local pastor. And in my later years as a traveling salesman, uh, as a media consultant, I would travel throughout the state of Mississippi, selling uh, advertisement for for my clients, and I would go and stay days at a time. And I remember packing my bag for those days, for those trips. And my, my wife says that I can't pack, and since then I've learned. But, but for, for example, if I was gone for a three-day trip, I would pack three pair of pants, I would put three shirts in the bag, I will put two pair of shoes. I would have belts to match those shoes. I would have my shower shoes. Because you know you don't want to step into a, 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 a dirty tub, right? Without your shower shoes on. I would put, I would have my toiletries, my, my, my shaving, my shaving material. I would have, and even while I was there, I would work out. So I would have to put in my workout clothes. Because you know you have to have at least two. Because you can't wear the same workout clothes twice. And on top of having workout clothes, I would put my workout shoes in the bag as well. So needless to say, my bag was pretty stuck. But along with all of those things, because I was a local pastor, I had to study while I was away. So I would throw books into the bag as well. I mean, commentary, Bible, the interpreter's Bible. And I would have the bag so stuck that I would have to get on top of it just to press it down. It was so stuck that it took me forever just to zip the bag up. And I remember one day while I was traveling in Greenwood, Mississippi, I checked into my, my hotel room. And when I was pulling my bag to my room, the handle of the bag snapped. But then it didn't bother me. I could still pick my bag up. It still, it still worked. I could still put all my things in the bag. So I carried my bag to the room. So that was my form of transportation with my bag, and I would just lift it up instead of pulling it. About two months later, I noticed when I was packing my bag that the, that the helm had started to stretch. It started to stretch to the point where you saw thread popping up through the helm. It was starting to unravel. But that didn't stop me from practicing what I practiced. I continue to stuff my bag. I continue to do the things that, that I knew to do. I continue to put five pair of pants, five shirts, two pair of workout shorts, two t-shirts, underwear, everything I needed, three pair of shoes, into the bag. Until one day, I was in the hotel room, and I was putting my books into the bag. I was putting my clothes into the bag. I was doing everything that I knew and as I uh, and tried to press down and zip the bag up, the zipper popped. It broke. You see, throughout the month, throughout the month, it was giving me signs that I was putting too much in it. Throughout the month, it was giving me a sign that I was stuffing the bag with too much, too much stuff. And it was, but I ignored the sign. And because I ignored the sign, it broke. It was at its breaking point, but I ignored the sign. And I, I come to you today that I know that this year, starting in 2020, and now in 2021, we are, some of us are at our breaking point. We're watching the numbers go up and down and up and down. We don't know whether to wear a mask or get vaccinated. We just don't know. 
we're watching our crime. Here in Jackson alone, we've had over 80 homicides. Over 80. And we're, we're on, we're on, we're, we are heading towards 150, which beats out the 130 from last year. And it's overwhelming. Our, our freedom. Just last week, we're, we were in the church, raised my hand. And now, I'm sitting looking at an almost empty sanctuary. It's frustrating. It's overwhelming. And I, and I asked you this morning, so what do you do when you reach that point? When you fill yourself up with all the stuff that's coming out of you, when you've invested so much that your stomach is sitting on full, that point when you're ready to throw in the towel, that when you're ready to give up and give in, that you've had enough, you know the point that we that crime doesn't even help, that point, that you've gotten to the point where it's enough, it's enough, what do you do when you reach that point? What do you do before you get to that point? My friends, I tell you, I say this, take comfort in God's Word. Take comfort in the knowledge and constant, unchanging character and purpose of God. You know, with so many changes and, and such uncertainty, we, we know that God is still God. And God is sovereign. And God is gracious. So God is concerned about us. He cares for us. Now, now hear me out. Let me not, hear me not say that you shouldn't get anxious. It, it, it's okay to get anxious at times. I, I mean, it's natural to feel overwhelmed at times because none of us are immune to the experiences of life. And these, and, and these emotions that we feel, they come. But what I am saying is how we respond to those situations and this time that we're in do we, do we succumb to our doubt, our fear, and our frustration? Or do we have faith in God to bring us through it? That God will be with us. That God would never leave us nor forsake us. That God would guide us through the valley of a shadow of death. And that we, that He would take us through it. This morning, I want to encourage you from God's Word and to point out some truths that we all need to hear. I, I, I think, I think, Pastor, this, this, this passage that I, that I want to introduce to you all this morning, that I want to uh, go back to this morning, I think it will lift up our spirits and give us a secure hope in Christ Jesus. God's Word is a, is a means by which we can enable us to hold on. It, it allows us to attach ourselves to Him like, like a baby, uh, like a baby to a mother's breast. In, in God's word, he, he has His promises. We see God's character, and we have His Holy Spirit, which empowers us through His word. So this morning, I, I want us to take. I want to take us through a familiar text. Pastor, this is my go-to text. Hey, when I'm feeling anxious, this is the text that I go to. When I start to worry, Deontay, then when I start to get frustrated, Mike, I go to this text. It's in a letter of Paul. Paul writes to the Philippian church. It's in a letter of, of Paul writes to the Philippian church. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Hear, hear these words from the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind 
in Christ Jesus. Mm. What, what an amazing word of comfort Paul is offering. But what, what an amazing word to get offer strength and encouragement uh, for a peace. Now, now, now you would think that Paul was writing from a palace. That he was he was being fanned but he was being fanned or had the AC blowing on the way he was writing. But Paul himself was in prison proclaiming the gospel before proclaiming the gospel too about Jesus Christ. He was writing to to a group of Christians at the time, a population, a community that were being persecuted because of their faith. A, a community that was filled with doubt and fear for their own lives and their future. They were being overwhelmed by the social media of that day. And there are so many things that I believe that we can learn from Paul's letter as he writes to, the, to this community. And I just want to point out a few. You have to have the right perspective. There can be a constant prayer. And if you have the right perspective, if you have the constant prayer, then it will yield peace. Perspective? Peace. You know, within any artist, we, we know that when, when they're painting or they're drawing something, perspective is everything. If, if you shift an angle, okay, everything moves. If the picture changes, and, and, and if any of the lines are wrong, if the perspective is all over the place, the picture won't look right. So having the right perspective, seeing things the right way, changes everything about how we respond to something and how we see it. So with all the news reports, the social media posts, with everything constantly changing, we see all these things. And we become overwhelmed because we start to focus on the things, on the happening. And not the God who's in control of the things. It, it, it shapes our perspective, uh, and, and, and that's not conducive to growth. It, it's not conducive to peace. It, it causes us to feel overwhelmed. It causes us to feel like my bad. It causes us to feel like we're at our breaking point. So we need to keep a healthy, biblical perspective on what's happening. Paul writes in verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. We always say, if something is worth saying, you got to do what? Say it twice. Paul says, rejoice twice. Paul was not with you. In, 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 in fact, in, in this letter, in fact, joy is one of the most dominant things in the whole letter. So, so you may want to ask Paul, in, in, in this time, Paul, when our babies are being killed, Paul, when, when our, our, our freedoms are being restricted, Paul, when, when, when we have an issue that we can't see, Paul, in this time, Paul, in this time, Paul, for joy, when, when the world around us, Paul, and that's ready with, during, during these uncertain times, is this time, Paul, for rejoicing? Paul, why should I rejoice? When I look at the tears of a mother crying over her baby's death, why should I rejoice, Paul? When I can't even come into the sanctuary and fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, why should I rejoice? Why should I rejoice? Is this time for rejoicing? If you ask Paul that question, Paul will say, <laughs> yes. Rejoice always. And Paul will even say, maybe it's, even, it, it, it's time to, eat, to rejoice even more. So see, you have to remember where Paul is at. Paul is in prison and has suffered hugely, but he still rejoices. Why is Paul rejoicing? Because his situation is it, it, not the only way to see the world. This is why we need to shift how we are seeing what's happening around us. Notice how Paul qualifies the rejoicing. He says, 
rejoice in Buddha. No. <laughs> he says rejoice because of yourself. No, no. Rejoice because of your situation. No. He says rejoice in the Lord. And the Lord is the object of the joy. The one we are rejoicing in and the ground for it. The reason for it. The source of the joy. So we can rejoice because Jesus is Lord. And that perspective, the way of looking at our lives in the world and the situation we find ourselves in, it is what governs and shapes our response in the things that we are facing. You see, joy is not the same as happiness. But we, because of humans, we, we, can, we can and should mourn with those who mourn. We can't feel the emotions that come with the disappointments of life and, and share with, with, with those who face hardship in our community. But when you think of joy, joy is different. Joy is deep-seated, it, it's a deep-seated confidence and contentment in God. Let, let me say that again. Joy is a deep-seated confidence and contentment in God. It's a knowledge that all things are in the hand. All things are in His hand. And our lives are in God's hand. And what a hand to be in. Because God, He remains the same. That no matter where we are, no matter how good or how bad the situation is, that all things are working together for the good of those who love God, because God is still God. Therefore, we should rejoice in the Lord and in all He and is and all He continues to be. Rejoice! But it's so easy to give into the darkness. And it's so easy to allow our thoughts our thoughts to go to go ahead of, of what we know to be the dominant one but versus looking and thinking of the things that are true and right which we should as Christians we begin to look around the world and it begins to shift who we are it begins to overwhelm us that's why we should go to the gospel because the gospel offer a different a different narrative it, it is this that would just shape our thinking and pass us to shape our believing. It says in the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that will shape our behavior too. Paul continues, he says, let your goodness be known to all. And he means by all, he means not only church folks, but all. Not just your friends, but all. Everybody. Everybody. One thing we can recognize is that Jesus is one of the most general, was one of the most general persons who ever lived on this earth. But, but we wouldn't say that Jesus is weak. Jesus is simple. And, and part of this, it means that Paul is saying we should be Christ's life. Paul is saying that we should allow Jesus to uh, Jesus to be known through how we respond to the challenges that we face as Christians. Paul says we should have a proper perspective because if we have a proper perspective, it gives us great strength. It gives us uh, it gives us a great strength to move forward. Paul says, let your gentleness be known to all. And how we should respond to the challenges that we face will be determined by our perspective. And we know that God is sovereign. And all this is, is God's strong and capable hands. It, it, we know that God's strong and capable hands are near. But we have to have that proper perspective to see God's strong and capable hands. But by this, I think Paul is, Paul is saying, the Lord's future coming to put, he's coming to put all things right that, that have went wrong. And, and it just changes our, our perspective. It, it, it's both a warning, but it's also encouragement. And when we have the perspective that our source and our happiness is in Him, 
that we have joy in Him, we can respond with grace to the situation around us. We find strength because He is in charge of all things. And that perspective, that way of seeing things, we, we can we can and should respond to all that's going on in the world in, 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 in a way that it reflects Christ. Now this this shift of perspective should be rooted in praise. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. But Paul says, some of us might struggle with this, but if an anxiety that affects us in different ways, he says, I, I get anxious and, and, and I worry about I worry about things sometimes, but it is one thing to, to be rightly concerned about something. It's another thing to be overwhelmed by something. But Paul says, the antidote to worry is prayer. You know, prayer is a privilege. We, we can speak directly to the creator of this universe. Prayer is full of promise. God promised to hear us when we pray in faith. Prayer is perspective changing. And as we pray, God shapes us and enables us to know His will for our lives because we, we can read this, this word alongside it because prayer is about actually entrusting ourselves to God and recognizing that we are not in control. And as we're not in, in, in control of our lives, that God is in control of our lives. And we pray with knowledge that we need Him, that we need Jesus. That Je- Jesus calls us to pray, our Father, our Heavenly Father. God, God loves to hear our prayers. He loves for us as, as His children to come to Him. You know, there's nothing like a child coming to their Father. You know, I wake up almost every morning to Ava Bray saying, Dad. When she needs something, she comes to Dad. When she wants something, she comes to Dad. When she don't want anything, she still comes to Dad. You see, we should, be, we should come to Daddy at all times because nothing is too great and nothing is too small for our Father. We, we may feel like that this global event that we're in, uh, the, 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 the situation that we've come to, it is it's too small or too big. But with, but with God, but with God, this is just what He, He will cover us. But first, there is, there is nothing that God is supposed to do. Let, let me say that again. No matter how big, That we can take to God. The Bible declares that all things, mysteriously and wonderfully, are in the hands of God, including what we find ourselves in the right now. Je- Jesus told his disciples, Do not be anxious about what you will eat, or what you will drink, or what you will wear. Your Father in heaven knows what you need. So Jesus tells, tells us not to be anxious. And if Jesus says that, we should sit up and listen. Because the very one who put up the stars in his, in his face, the very one who created everything that we see, the very one that he says, don't be anxious. But I'm with you. Don't worry. But put it in him. You know, each summer, I take my kids uh, on some type of camping trip. My kids at this year, I take them on some type of camping trip, and there's always these rock climbers. And you know, they, they, they show you how to climb up the wall. But, you never, but they don't tell you that in order to come back down, that you have to grab the rope, and you have to lean it back. That you have to trust in the person that's holding the rope to guide you down. You see, the rope of faith in Jesus Christ is strong and secure, and it will take your weight so we can lean on Him. We can trust in Him. In, in times of crisis, that, 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 that means to know that, that 
our faith it is well founded. Now, now is it's time to trust in our Heavenly Father that we should cast our cares on Jesus, that we should be overburdened because Jesus Christ, His, his yoke, His yoke is easy, His burden is light. So we should trust that He has it all in His hands. And to pray for the world, not to succumb to the doubt and worry, not to pray, but to lift our world to God who intercedes for our world. That's what we need to do when we pray. We pray we not only lift up our situation, but we lift up our world to God. But Paul said something to He didn't just say pray. He said we must pray with thanksgiving. You know, these are dark times, but in the darkness, even the beautiful grow bright. There are, there are many things that we can be thankful for. You know, we, we had uh, two of our, two of our, um, our congressmen, two, uh, Daniel and, and Bo Petrie, undergo this uh, major surgery, and they're doing well. Oh, man, that's life in the plan. You know, we, we're not in church today, but fortunately we had an opportunity in the midst of this crisis to come for a couple of months and celebrate one another. That's life in the midst of darkness. Even when we are apart, we still can connect through the technology that's light in the midst of darkness. You see, the, the people in our lives the most of, are, are important to us, but we're still able to connect even when we are apart. That's light in the midst of darkness. And that's a reason for us to be thankful. So, for the right perspective, shaped by prayer, absolutely bring. The knowledge of God's presence and the power of prayer leads us to God's peace. You know, the psalmist writes, The yea, don't walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. How will you not fear evil? Because God is with you. He has peace because God is going through the valley with you. You know, some. Some Bible translation says that they go out walk through the, the darkest valley. I fear no evil. But Paul writes, the peace of God that passes all understanding would keep your heart and mind in Jesus Christ. That the peace of God surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It, it, it was Jesus that stood amongst his disciples on the evening of the resurrection. He declared, Peace be with you, God Shalom. And peace in, in the Bible means more than just the absence of war and conflict. It means where, where there was a fraction, a, a fracture, it is now man. Where, where there is division, and there is now unity. And Paul was facing his own isolation. He was in prison for his faith, for his faith separated from his friends. But the peace of God, he had supernatural peace because of God. A peace which defies explanation. A peace that the world cannot manufacture. A peace that makes people stop and ask. How can you be so peaceful in a time like this? How can you watch the numbers go up and up and you have peace? How can you watch our communities in, in the streets that we're in and still have peace? How, how can you, you know, your freedom be restricted but you still have peace? It's the peace, y'all, that only God can give. A peace which he provides to his people and enable them to trust in his power and in his promise. His presence and his presence. You know, Jesus calms the storm. He, he wakes up and calls out to the wind and the waves 
to stop what they do. He says, peace, be still. You see, the peace which surrounds Jesus, that, that Jesus brought, gave him a security. And so we need to remember that when we're in our own time, that when we're in our own difficult time, that God is peace. The picture that Paul paints here when he says that the peace will guard our hearts, he, the picture that he's painting is like an army of soldiers surrounding us, guarding our hearts, letting nothing get near our hearts and our minds. Imagine the U.S. military standing in front of your heart, standing in your front of your mind. Imagine the U.S. military standing in front of your heart and your mind with the command to not let anybody get to your heart or your mind. Millions of soldiers standing before your heart, guarding and protecting your heart and mind. You see, this is the type of peace that God offers. God promised to guard our heart and our mind. He promised to put an army in front of our heart and our mind so that when the world is acting up, that we still can focus on the God that controls it all. That when we know that we have God on our side, it, it, it changes everything about us. We have a sense of peace when we pray. We have a sense of peace when, we, when we're walking through the fire. We won't get burned because we know that God has just protected us. Now, it doesn't mean that there are times that we, that we won't work. It doesn't mean that, that the, the storms will stop happening because the storms will fail. You know, the weapons will fail. But they won't prosper. We are confident that we have a God that is with us. We're confident that we have a God that will never leave us and that we, that, that we have a God that will never forsake us. The church family. In this time, I say to you the same words that Paul said to the church of Jesus. Regardless of what you have going on, I know you may feel overwhelmed. I know you may feel like you've reached your breaking point. I know your anxiety levels are, are like a roller coaster ride. Gain the part of yourself. Saturate it with praise. Saturate the life with praise. And we can feel God's peace. And that peace is on our heart. And our mind. Amen. So are we done with Thank you that um, even during these times, where we look at the, look out at the sand and we only see one set of footprints, and we oftentimes think those those footprints are ours. But God, we know that it's just simply you carrying us through. God, we thank you for carrying us through. We thank you, God, that we don't have to enter into the valley alone that you are with us. We thank you that you provide peace that the world cannot manifest. God, I pray that we succumb to your will and that our anxiety succumb to your peace. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you are out there, You haven't connected with Christ. You're not saved. We invite you now to connect to the source of peace that surpasses all understanding. The 
Word tells us all we have to do is just confess and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and we shall be saved. We are seeing the invitation to you now. To say that simple prayer. Lord, I, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, I believe that, that God raised Him from the dead. I believe it. As you say that simple prayer, we want to hear from you. Our information is on the screen. You can email us. You can DM us. We want to hear from you. Because we understand that as you're, as you're journeying through life, you need a community to support the journey. And if you stand in the need of prayer, we believe that the effectual perfect prayer of the righteous of those money. We ask that you email us or DM us. We will pray for you. On every Wednesday night, uh, we have our Praying Without Season plus our, our, we have our hour of power. We're going to bring a word and prayer every Wednesday night. We ask that you join us. Start at 7 o'clock. The information is on the screen. We also, we, we invite you to join us next week uh, via Facebook. We also repost on YouTube. We want to stay connected with you. We ask that you share this with or your friends because we want the word to go out. Because we understand that it will not return to us. And if we're all, if we're all connected, if we're all working towards the purpose of God, if we're all joined together, we can see a change. So we invite you to join us. Now that peace, the God that offers true peace, may that peace be with you. You may go into